mentioned Bochica, a character from the mythology of central Colombia, was also a civilizer. According to the natives, Bochica was of a different race, but still human. He taught the locals to build huts and live in peace amongst each other. After the flood, he taught the people the secrets of agriculture and construction, instituted sun worship, and then departed. The Incan people of Peru speak of the previously discussed Viracocha. This name, Viracocha, was given to both the miracle-working savior and the group that was with him. According to the Inca, a day came after the flood when their people were approached by a teacher and healer they would come to call Viracocha. He cured the sick, healed the blind, taught man how to live in peace and love, and even gave more scientific instruction regarding agriculture and architecture. This character worked miracles like moving mountains and made streams of fresh water flow. He addressed the locals as his children and spoke the local tongue better than the natives. Viracocha would part company with the Inca by sailing across the sea, promising to return. His physical description was that of a white man, past middle age, blue eyes, a long cloak reaching to his knees, and a full gray beard. In some variations, Viracocha was called the Nupa, who was killed by a group of jealous conspirators, and whose body was placed on a boat and cast into Lake Titicaca. Instead of drifting away slowly, the boat sailed away rapidly and out of sight. Then you have the Egyptian god Osiris. Like Jesus, Osiris is associated with goodness and resurrection. He, like Viracocha, was a civilizer. Despite the fact that Osiris is not the most ancient of the Egyptian gods, he was still proclaimed to be the lord of the universe at the moment of his birth. Osiris came upon the Egyptian people bearing gifts of knowledge and love. This civilizer established Egypt's first legal code and abolished cannibalism and human sacrifice. Osiris then left Egypt, traveling around the world teaching and civilizing the people of other kingdoms and races. He did not use his powers to force people, but instead preferred gentle persuasion. After returning to Egypt, Osiris was conspired against by his evil brother Set and 72 accomplices. Set murdered his brother Osiris by locking him into a coffin and throwing it into the Nile River. Instead of sinking into the depths of the Nile River forever, which was the intention and expectation of the conspirators, the coffin sailed away rapidly. Set would eventually discover the coffin containing the body of his brother Osiris in a hidden place. Infuriated that his brother survived, in a sense, Set cut Osiris' body into 14 parts and scattered the pieces, seeing to it that his brother would forever remain out of his midst. Isis, a goddess who was both Osiris' wife and sister, which is common in mythology, brought her husband back to life by locating and recombining his scattered parts with sorcery. She failed to find the phallus or penis of Osiris, however, and was forced to substitute one made of gold. After this, Osiris would not live long and was soon dead once more, but it was said that he periodically reappears among humans. The ancient Mesopotamians in present-day Iraq have a civilizer of their own who they called Onus. This being was amphibious but spoke human languages with ease. Onus would emerge out of the water, teaching and giving instruction to humans. He taught people writing, the sciences, the arts, architecture, and agriculture. He is often depicted as a man with the scales of a fish. And let's not forget Lone Man, the savior figure of the Mandan people. Lone Man, like Jesus, was born of a virgin, settled turbulent waters while aboard a boat, and was perfect in all his ways. And finally, you have the god Pharaoh from the tales of the people of Mali. Pharaoh, as stated before, transformed himself into a fish and eventually sacrificed himself to undo the sins of his terrible and evil brother Pembe. And Pharaoh, like our Osiris, was cut into pieces and scattered. I have often wondered what Christians mean when they say that Jesus died for our sins and his death represented a great sacrifice that somehow redeemed my soul. Listening to Christians explain how that actually works is usually amusing, 
and always results in a comical, unsatisfactory answer. To live in heaven, spend 33 years on earth, be murdered on a cross, three days in the underworld, and back up to heaven for all eternity does not constitute saving my soul, nor even a sacrifice. Jesus living a long life of pain and toil instead of a short 33 years, and then going to heaven is more of a sacrifice, but because he still goes to heaven, I can't envision what those extra decades of his life have to do with my soul. Far from blinking out of existence after dying on the cross, which would indeed represent a sacrifice, he instead had a get out of jail free card and a one way ticket back to heaven. Even the story of his life on earth is a bit broken. Jesus, as a child, was intensely curious and full of wonder. Then there's a whole 18 years of his life that's completely unaccounted for in the Bible. Then, at age 30, he pops back up with magical abilities and, instead of an all-consuming curiosity, has all the answers. Jesus' time among man may not have been fun, but he should have at least been honored to jumpstart a religion of benevolence with those 33 years. A mere 33 years between two eternities in paradise is but an infinitely small sliver of time. He sacrificed himself for my sins, what does that even mean? Now, under normal circumstances, all I could do is relate to you this Chosen One's reappearance in mythology, and perhaps a bit of philosophical commentary. Luckily, a few occultists have given me some insight on this subject, in a most annoyingly hush-mouthed manner as well. They speak of him as though he represented a major setback to the plan. And where was the Lord in those 18 years? Was he on a mission of initiation, civilizing, and demon hunting? They speak of him as though he did take a huge risk in coming here, as if Jesus' guaranteed trip back to heaven is only a myth. I've even heard Jesus spoke of as a renegade, a police-like figure who hunted demons. More on this later. If mythology is in fact eccentric tales created to explain creation itself, then why so many corresponding details? If the evolutionists are right regarding the birth and evolution of humanity, and they're not, then it means these stories stem from the time when man was of one blood and in one location. That was, admittedly, a long time ago, 15,000 years at the bare minimum, according to their timelines. How and why? Did collective humanity cling to such stories for so long? Mythological stories are loaded with fanciful and often racy imagery, characters, and storylines. The comings and goings of the gods seem more akin to the machinations of a drunk poet rather than a true record of history. It's easy to see how men like Freud came to their conclusions about mythology, being nothing more than stories that symbolically represent the inner and outer struggles of the individual. There is yet another source of confusion that pervades some mythologies. And that confusion is born from multiple names and titles associated with a single god. For example, the Egyptian goddess Hathor is associated with two other goddesses, Isis and Bast. Sometimes Hathor is spoke of as the mother of Horus, which would mean Hathor and Isis were the same entity. In other cases, the title Hathor is associated with Bast, who is known to not be Isis. Also, in Egyptian mythology, Ra is the sun god, but then again, so is Osiris, and Osiris' son, Horus. All three are known as sun gods, and all three are confirmed as different beings. I suspect that the Hindus have the best grasp on what's actually happening here. In the Hindu religion, gods come upon man in the form of avatars. Vishnu, for instance, has come upon man nine times already, meaning there are